Okay. Just tell them I'm an oceanographer, not a marine anything else. <laughs> I will. Okay. Uh, all right. Just one second. All right. So good evening, everybody. My name is Matthew Adams. I'm um, sorry for the quick delay, but we had some technical difficulties there. Uh, I am the uh, director of graduate admissions for the Almost College of Arts and Sciences. Um, but I'd like, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hirons tonight. Uh, Amy is an associate professor here at the Department of Marine Biology and Environmental Sciences at MSU. Uh, her research includes uh, marine trophic dynamics and uh, ocean production, uh, coastal and oceanographic conditions on marine production, uh, tra tracing uh, geographic variability in marine food sources, and global climate change, just to name a few of them. Uh, Amy has written and contributed to various publications, uh, including journal articles, data sets, and reports. Um, she has presented a wide range of subject areas as well. But tonight's uh, presentation will be in large part, you know, an informational webinar uh, regarding use of biomonitoring ocean production and contaminants using marine mammals. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Amy. Uh, I'm available for questions. Uh, as well as our assistant director, Nicole Chavans, after the presentation, if you have questions about our graduate programs, um, but especially if you're interested in, in any of the marine science uh, or biological science uh, master's degree. So Amy, at this point in time, we wanna thank everybody for attending and, and it's now turned over to you. Oh, good evening, everybody. It's really nice to be here. Uh, please at any time, submit questions through the chat. Nicole will be glad to uh, channel them for us. So I'm going to jump into talking about, as, as Matt really introduced for us, the use of biologics or biomonitoring. So basically using biological organisms to monitor. So I'm an oceanographer. My focus in our lab, which is the Charismatic Megafauna and Oceanography Lab, also known as CMOL, we tend to, we'll use a whole spectrum of different biological organisms to tell us what's going on in the ocean. And we're used to really looking at ocean energy. And oftentimes when people think of ocean energy, they're thinking of waves and currents. And we incorporate that as well. But what we're doing is using uh, marine mammals for the most part in telling us what's actually going on in a food web and uh, not just food webs because you probably heard that expression you are what you eat but you're also uh, incorporating all kinds of different elements about the environment so uh, and that can be both positive and negative so in this case what i'm going to do tonight is introduce marine, um, sorry, I'm trying to get me, get this to forward, there we go. So we focus predominantly on food webs. And in our lab, we'll look at anything from the microorganisms, phytoplankton, the microscopic plants, and zooplankton, uh, the microscopic animals, through small invertebrates to large invertebrates. Uh, we'll look at small organisms or sort of middle of a food web, all the way up to apex predators, which might be eating other mammals. It could be birds. It could be uh, colonial organisms like corals. So really can look at the whole spectrum of organisms. But a lot of what we do and what the focus tonight is going to be is strictly on marine mammals. And we will think of a marine mammal and you go, oh, it's really high in the food web. They must be eating just large fishes and big squids. But the fact of the matter is they really run the gamut. In the upper left here is an image of a bowhead whale. 
and they are baleen whales. So they don't have teeth and they actually filter their food from the water column. So they're actually eating those microscopic organisms where next to it, to the right, you might recognize is a manatee. And manatees are herbivores. So they're strictly ingesting plant material. Whereas in the lower left, we've got an image of a sea otter. Well, they predominantly forage on bivalves, shellfish. So those organisms tend to live on the benthos or on the ocean floor. And they're incorporating different organisms in the food web. Whereas you might be looking at that stellar sea lion over to the right in the lower image, and they're eating those large fish and maybe squid and octopus. So we're really getting a good coverage of the whole food web. And then we've got a real apex predator like our Orsinus orca, also known as a killer whale. And they can be eating either fish or marine mammals. So I think this kind of image won't really surprise many of us. So this is an image of uh, some of my colleagues in Antarctica. So our work will go from pole to pole. We work from the Arctic through the central oceans, through the tropics, all the way to Antarctica. And what I really should have done is taken an image when we first were going, or I was first going in the early 90s. So what you see here in this ice flow are a couple of my colleagues. And then if you look carefully over here to the far left is a Waddell seal. And that's the goal is to get information from that animal. And so that's really what I'm gonna be talking about tonight. But the kind of information we're gonna get from the animal is recording, yes, things that it's ingesting, things that it's ingesting affected by the environment, but also the results of additional items going into the environment. So while the previous image was showing ice pack and really what we call pancake ice. And that's a result of a warming environment and a warming ocean, not just the air. But we've also got what we call anthropogenic effects or human induced effects, whether it is from pesticides or herbicides we use for agriculture, trying to feed the world, mining processes, trying to get certain elements, maybe for the microprocessors in our computers and our phones, uh, industrial waste. And it's not even just what we might consider waste, but we we'll also call it a byproduct. And urbanization. If those of you have been here in South Florida the last few weeks, we've had some torrential rains without even getting major storm impact. So where is all that water running? Across hard surfaces, over roads and parking lots and down buildings and roofs. And it's picking up all kinds of particulates but also dissolved substances along the way. And those dissolved substances as well as those particulates are making their way into the ocean. Now, I could have shown you an image that we've probably all seen of a floating or suspended plastic bag or other bits of microplastics. Okay. We can think about that and go, gee, I wouldn't want to diet plastic. If I ate just plastics, I wouldn't get any nutrients and I would start to starve and even suffocate. But what's also happening, if we look at the weathering process here on the upper part, is as the sun, the UV radiation, starts to break down these plastics into smaller and smaller pieces, the microplastics. They're not just staying in bits of plastic, they're starting to degradate into all of the chemical components, and some of which are represented here on the lower right. But that chemicals can also become adhered, sort of absorbed onto surfaces of sediment. It can be absorbed into uh, surfaces of organisms. It can be ingested 
by even those microscopic organisms like those zooplankton and phytoplankton. And then they make their way up through about the food web. And then even they can settle out in sediment, they can settle out in fecal pellets and waste products. So there's all this recycling that's getting taken place, that is taking place. Now that's modern. What this image here is showing is from the North Slope of Alaska. And so this top part here is called peat, P-E-A-T. So it's organic material, but you don't see a bunch of trees and you don't see a lot of shrubbery that have big root systems. Why? Because all of this soil is frozen. This is what we call permafrost, as in permanent frost. The problem is, as the air warms and the water warms, that ice, like an ice cube, is starting to fracture and break off. And what's happening is that we're losing whole sections of this earth every year and it falls into the ocean. So not only do we have all of those modern contaminants, we now have a long history of, you think, well, that was not contaminants 400, 500, 1,000 years ago. Yeah, but there's a lot of carbon that got locked up into that soil. And we think of those CO2s or that greenhouse gas. Now it's being released into the ocean. So what I'm gonna be talking about specifically tonight is not the chemical processes and not necessarily the end product. You think, oh my gosh, all of these horrible things are going into the ocean and it's going to kill organisms, plants and animals like this poor dead seal here. And that may be a direct impact, but what we don't oftentimes see are the indirect impacts, the slow wearing away at the health of not just an individual, not just its population of a species, but the wearing away and the degradation of entire environments. And that's what our research is really focusing on and looking at. So what we're taking advantage of, by the way, ignore any background noise here, is the ability for all of these organisms, predominantly marine mammals, they move. They move through different water bodies. And what this image is showing here is not just a variety of marine mammals, but also other apex predators like large fish, including sharks, and also seabirds and sea turtles. So if you look along the bottom of this image here and see all these different colors, they represent different animals. So when you look at all of these sort of colored dots, which seem to make up lines, this is actually showing movement of individuals of all these different species. So what we're actually taking advantage of is using all of these moving animals as instruments, basically, biological instruments to monitor what's taking place in different parts of the water column or even completely different water bodies. And to do that, we're going to use a variety of different tissues because these different tissues grow at different rates and they get replaced at different rates. For example, we all probably have hair on our bodies and we lose hair every day. We lose skin cells that have died and sloughed off every day. We lose red blood cells every day. They die and we replace them with new red blood cells. All the cells in our bodies are doing that. So what I'm gonna talk about now are how we use some of the different tissues in marine mammals. You might say, why marine mammals? I've just said we work on anything from mangroves, seagrasses, microscopic plants and animals, all the way through to apex predators. The reason we tend to focus on these apex predators for these organisms that tend to feed and live at the upper part of a food web is because they're incorporated 
all of these other organisms throughout. They may not be directly eating seagrass, but maybe they've eaten a fish that has eaten a smaller fish that ate a shrimp that was living and feeding on the algae in the seagrass. So using different biochemical techniques, we try to tease all of these things apart. So this image here is a northern fur seal. And what I'm really wanting you to look at are the whiskers, also known as vibrissa. And they are made of keratin, just like our fingernails and hair are. And what they do, just like our hair, which I said we lose every day, but we can regrow. Whiskers can be the same thing, except they're a really stout version, and they're also highly innervated. There's lots of nerve endings, so they can give a lot of information to this animal. I mean, it's a fur seal, and you can see from the image, it has fur, it has other types of hair. But these whiskers continuously grow, just like our hair. And so the base of the whisker right here along their cheek is the newest growth. And they continue to grow outward. Well, the oldest growth is out here at the tips where it gets worn away and broken. And in the case of some animal like a fur seal or a sea lion, we can get many years worth of information. What are we getting information on? What they ate what they ingested, what got incorporated into their tissues. So when we look at a biochemical signature, in this case, this is what we call stable isotopes. We're looking at the stable isotope of carbon and nitrogen. Why carbon, why nitrogen? We're carbon-based life forms. So we can look at the carbon and try to get an idea of what is the source of the carbon. So the base of everything in our food webs, certainly in the photic zone, in the light zone, are plants. So we can get an idea of different types of carbon that it makes up different types of plants, also different types of environments. In the case of the ocean, is it a near shore environment? Or is it more offshore? Is it from surface water? Is it from deeper in the ocean? So I said that this first seal, that whisker could represent many years. Well, this signature here, or this cycling pattern is one whisker. And zero here represents the base or that cheek part of the whisker, all the way out here to the tip. And what we notice, particularly if we look at sort of this rosy pink color, which is the nitrogen, you can see this oscillating pattern going up and down and up and down. It's a little, less clear in the carbon. But what the nitrogen's telling us is that, oh, this is an animal that is represented, this whisker represents many years. As a matter of fact, there's one, two, three, four, five, going on to its sixth year, that it's recorded what it ate, but the other thing it records is where it ate it because fur seals are a migratory animal. They were one of the animals represented in that previous image showing tracking data. Okay, great. The nice thing about whiskers too, you don't have to hurt the animal. You can go ahead and pluck a whisker. So here are two other types of pinnipeds. On the left is a stellar sea lion, and on the right is a harbor seal. I like the image on the left working with one of the trainers is because it gives you a perspective of how large that animal is and how big its head is. And you can also see it has short whiskers and it has long whiskers. But what I really want you to note are the teeth, particularly these canine teeth here. And they look pretty large, don't they? When you compare it to the harbor seal, Without having a human hand or head there, it's harder to tell, but harbor seal is much smaller. So when we look at this next image, and those are those canine teeth, not from that particular animal, these were from a dead animal. This part of the canine tooth is what's exposed in that previous image here. That's what you see. 
The rest of this is the root. This is what's growing in the jaw of that animal. Likewise, in the harbor seal, this is the part of the tooth that you get to see. The rest of that is the root. What does that do for us? We can actually cut that tooth longitudinally on the long axis. And if you look carefully, you see these numbers, you can see sort of these dark and light bands. Those are what we call growth layer groups. They're like tree rings. And they can go, a light and a dark tells us the season, whether it's fast growing in the summer or slow growing in the winter. But it also gives us age. In this case, this animal is 13 years old. It has 13 layers. But then we can do similar biochemical analyses like we did on the whiskers. And it can give us information about what that animal's eaten, where it's been, but also has it been incorporating different types of organic or inorganic contaminants during its time. We can look at other animals who have a very different uh, life history pattern. And this is a narwhal. You might have heard of a narwhal or seen them before. This actually is sometimes called a tusk. But it's not really a tusk. It's actually a modified canine tooth. This is a type of whale, a toothed whale. So evolutionarily, it modified one of those upper canines. And this is what a series of tusks or that tooth looks like from a narwhal. You can see it's got a very spiral pattern to its growth but it's very long. Those tusks are well over a meter to a meter and a half in length in these males. Well, what we can do in a tusk is similar to what we do with the canines. We split them longitudinally and can grind out different growth layers to find out what has this animal been eating? Where has it been? But also how has its environment changed? during much of its adult life. So now we can actually move to even larger whales. In this case, this is a bowhead whale. I showed you an image of it before when I was showing you uh, animals eating different types of prey items. Well, indigenous peoples or native peoples to certain lands are allowed to hunt marine mammals. Why? because they use every part of the animal. They will eat a whale, much like you might eat a hamburger and go, oh, you don't necessarily stop to think that that's from a cow. But they not only eat the animal, but they'll use, for example, all of these here are baleen plates. They use them in construction. They'll use parts of the animal for their, um, food, for their uh, construction, for their house, for their craft items. But what we can do, and what's oftentimes been used in the past, particularly to look at not just diet, but also contaminants in diet, is what's known as muktuk. This is actually the thick blubber from the whale. This black layer right here is actually their very thick skin. So this is a, a important energy source for these indigenous peoples. You might know them as Eskimos or in um, Inupiaqs. But what we're doing is moving beyond something like the blubber, which is fat or lipid, and it has a really high turnover rate. That means those cells get used, where they get used for energy. And, but then they get replaced, just like our fat cells will get used and then they get replaced. What we decided to do is look at tissues that have a longer growing pattern. In this case, this is a series of individual baleen plates. So I mentioned before that they filter feed those microscopic organisms, which get caught in all that little fringe. But Baleen is the same material as the whiskers on a pinniped or hair or fingernails or claws. So it continuously grows 
from the base here all the way out. So again, we get a really long timeline, many, many years. And in this case, I'm showing this is a single baleen plate from an animal that dates from the summer of 1987 to the winter of 1979. So there's nearly a decade's worth of information in just this section of baleen. What all these different color lines are, are different heavy metals, including things like cadmium and cobalt and mercury, some of which are essential and needed by the animal, but some of which are non-essential. It's like you hear about mercury, whether it's methylmercury or total mercury. And that can be very damaging over time to organ tissue. Another tissue that has recently been utilized is something that colleagues of mine at Baylor in Texas and I have used. This is an earplug, also known as earwax. In whales, in this case, it's from a fin whale. Earwax gets laid down like a rolled up Tootsie Roll or a roll of toilet paper so that it creates layer after layer. So again, it looks very similar to the layers that we might see in teeth or in tree rings. And you can see these layers here that are very sequential. So you can actually unroll this hard pack that's very lippity. Uh, you know, so it's very slick feeling. And not only are um, we looking at the age of an animal, but we're also extracting hormones from the animals. So we can tell at a certain point in time in their life, and this earplug represents an animal's entire life. And you can actually see when they became sexually mature. You can see the change in uh, different hormones. You can see changes in cortisol hormone. Find out when there were time periods in their life where they were very stressed. So we go, oh, was this animal migrating or living in a part of the world's ocean where there might still be hunting? Or we, in some animals, we could actually see stress points that date back to the 1940s during World War II when there was a lot of bombing taking place at sea and against submarines. So we can take advantage of the fact that there are various institutions around the world that collect and preserve parts of marine mammals. In this case here, this is the uh, assistant curator of the marine mammal collection and a personal friend of mine, Charlie Potter, at the uh, Smithsonian Institution's uh, National Museum of Natural History. That is part of a blue whale skull in a warehouse that is full of skulls and vertebrae of whales. If you look along all those racks, those are the backbones of individual blue whales. And all around, Charlie and Jim and John and Nadine are different parts. You can see a whole whale skeleton being laid out here on the floor with its ribs and the skulls, the jaws, et cetera. And what we can do is actually different biochemical analyses, looking at stable isotopes, looking at heavy metals, looking for organic contaminants, looking at genetic material from different bones and looking at the hard part of a bone or looking at the organic matrix of the bone, like collagen. And they can all tell us different things. They're recording different information. They can tell us uh, about radioactivity on the planet, whether it was man-made, was there a bomb going off, bomb testing, or was this radioactivity from a major volcanic eruption that took place at a certain time period. So there's an incredible amount of information that is locked up in tissues. That kind of information can give us an idea of environmental change. In this case, we're looking at a series of change from 
the Gulf of Alaska, which used to be strictly dominated by these ruby red shrimp. That was the main fisheries in Alaskan waters in the 1960s. But in the 1970s, you start to see these large non-fatty fish to by the 1980s and to today. The system is dominated not by shrimp. You can't find a shrimp at all. It's walleye pollock. It is Pacific cod, these sort of non-fatty fish. What this tissue is really telling us, no matter what you use, what time period that you use, depending on the growth rate or turnover in these different tissues, is has there been changes in ocean temperature? How is that telling us anything? Well, ocean temperature changes can tell us changes in production in the ocean, and that relates to food. It also can relate to other types of tissues or other types of material recording environmental change, like this purplish brown, the tree ring data. It can give us information about does it match up to like the, this uh, sort of rosy pink color? That's actually sediment information there. This is baleen. This is actually bone from seals. So you can take a whole series of different tissues and different materials that aren't even organic like sediment that are locking up information and then we can compare them. This is a reconstruction through the Holocene using just one species, a stellar sea lion, and looking at bone collagen. And what do we see is that there are these patterns of change that have taken place over the last 7,000 years. So while we are in a time period where humans have had a major impact on the environment, so much so to the extent we've never seen these kinds of changes. But what this information is also saying is even before the Industrial Revolution, there have been cycles of change on our planet. And we have to tease out what that means. This is just another example of a sediment core showing some of those very similar patterns that I just showed in the previous slide with those oscillations shown in sea lions. So this is salmon that actually return to fresh water to spawn and then they die. So they leave their tissue, their chemical signature in the sediment in these lakes and rivers. I guess my last point I want to leave you with is to remember that no matter what culture you personally have grown up in and are used to, you've got to try and keep a holistic image of how organisms and environments are utilized around the planet. Even if we just think about just humans, this is another example of indigenous people or native peoples using marine mammals, much like you might use a turkey or a pig or a cow to also survive. But I would venture to guess that you're probably not using the feathers of that turkey to stuff your pillow, where these people are actually going to use the skin of these animals to make coats or slippers. So at this point, I will stop and entertain any questions that you might have. Um, Amy, that was fascinating. That was so interesting. Um, we do have a couple questions so far, and if anybody has any more, please feel free to add them in the chat or the Q&A section. Um, first is, uh, I think, mostly a comment from Hayden. Um, they just wanted to understand you correctly. And so they were asking if you can find out what a seal ate and where it ate just by analyzing a small part of its body, like the whisker. Absolutely. And you don't even necessarily need the entire whisker. We actually will take a whisker and use only about, uh, we'll cut it into little segments of about uh, two millimeters in length. 
and we'll analyze those pieces. And that's what helps build the timeline here for a baleen plate, which might be, it might be really short. It might only be a half a meter in length, or it could be more like three or four meters in length, like those bowhead whales. And we might sample it every half centimeter and we'll get multiple samples that represent one year so we can get seasonality. So it, it, there's the potential is great and it's growing. Uh, the example I gave of the, my, my colleagues in, in Texas at Baylor who have now started to be able to extract hormones. I mean, we used to think, oh, you could only get hormone from a blood sample because that's how hormones cycle through a body. But the fact is it's getting locked up into all of these tissues. So, uh, you know, it's like maybe you've heard somebody who's gonna have a drug test and they can, are they gonna have a breathalyzer test? Are they having a blood test, a urine test, maybe uh, some of their hair? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not an unusual thing to use different tissue from different organisms. It's how we're using it. It's like, it can tell us so much. The trick is learning what is it really telling us? It, it tells me a lot. What does it mean? It's being able to read it, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much anything like that. Mm -hmm. wow. Incredible. Um, we had one more question in the Q&A section and I already know I'm gonna have trouble reading this. Um, so please forgive me if I mispronounce anything or say anything wrong. Um, but they asked, how do, oh, I see it. How do epiphytes? Yep. Thank you. <laughs> on foods such as seagrass and a manatee diet impact those stable isotopes, the carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes. Mm. This is really interesting because what you do is you actually have to scrape off so epiphytes, epi, like epidermis means surface and phyte means plants. So it's like epiphytes are surface growing plants on something. So in this case, it's algae that actually sort of has, if you like snorkel around and you look at sea grasses and things, you sort of see, oh, that looks like brown fuzz or something on its plant. It's actually algae growing on the surface of anything. And in this case, it's another plant. So what you've got to do to get the separate signatures from these things is isolate it. And so in this case, we take a very sharp, uh, either a, a metal blade or sometimes we use glass if we're going to do a, a look for metal contaminants and scrape those off to try and isolate just the seagrass and then just the algae. And what we did find interestingly is uh, oftentimes people will make observations about watching another animal eat an animal or eat a plant. So they're taking, you know, trusting the human eye. But what we really need to do is sort of do the biochemical, get to the molecular level and go, did it really eat that seagrass? And what we have found out in a variety of studies is it's not so much the seagrass that's gotten eaten, it was the algae on the seagrass. And looking at the biochemical signature, we were actually able to determine that. They were distinct enough to go, wow, okay. So maybe it got its nutrition from the algae, but it might've also got any organic and or inorganic contaminants as well. Is there anything else I can help answer? And after, and just so you know that if something comes to you or you want to um, find out a little more information, my email is located here at the bottom of the slide. Again, this is the, our, our lab is the CMO lab. Um, my email is hirons at nova.edu. Our websites are there. Feel free to reach out at any time if you've got a question or just want to learn a little more information. We have a variety of graduate as well as a variety of undergraduate students doing all kinds of different research in the lab, not just marine mammal based. And for those who might not have asked a question but wondered, it does take a lot of effort to work with marine mammals. 
there's no doubt there are a lot of regulations, a lot of permitting that takes place. Uh, I mentioned we work pole to pole. Uh, so certainly getting to these locations can be challenging. Uh, some animals are far easier to work with than others. Pinnipeds, the seals, the sea lions, fissipeds like sea otters, they tend to be and will come up on land. So they'll either come up on land to breed, to give birth. So you can time usually certain times of the year. So we time when we're gonna be in the field to the times when the animals are gonna haul out to come out on land. Um, working with cetaceans, the whales, whether they're the toothed whales or the baleen whales is very challenging because they don't have to and never come out on land. They don't come out on, on ice, they may be moving through ice. So you have to be able to modify and plan when you're gonna be at a certain location. And oftentimes our work is very collaborative because it's expensive, it's a resource exhaustive. And we want to make sure that whatever we're putting out that a lot of people can take advantage. So there may be people doing acoustics work or they may be doing behavioral studies at the same time at, that you're trying to collect tissues. Um, the way we collect tissues from free swimming whales, for example, is we may use a type of modified um, crossbow, an arrow that has a solid tip on it, uh, where we can get a little bit of a, a skin and blubber plug as they're swimming by. To them, it would be the equivalent of like us getting maybe bit by a mosquito. They don't really know and it doesn't hurt and the skin closes up right around them. Uh, I see Hayden has a question that do we work with sharks? Um, absolutely. As I've mentioned before, we've worked with a lot of pelagic fishes, pretty much everything. Um, and when it comes to elasmobranchs, we've done some with stingrays. Uh, we have another grad student at, uh, at the Oceanographic Center also doing some stable isotope analysis on a suite of different elasmobranchs uh, to try and determine some seasonality and location to their diets. Um, we had one more question asking what role does tissue type play in the data that it can provide? So when you're going to think about how would I go about answering this question I have, when you go, do I want to incorporate information that has time? So a temporal pattern. Am I looking for spatial distribution? Does this organism move? What kind of area does it cover? And then we go, well, what if, if this is an animal, let's say, that is migrating or moving and you want to get as much time out of a tissue as possible and you think, okay, what could I get? What is going to grow a lot? And then you've got to think, can I get this from an animal, this tissue, uh, without harming the animal? Do I need, because you can't just go out and kill a marine mammal. Now, I've certainly worked for many years with indigenous communities and organizations to collaboratively work with them as they're hunting to feed their family, their villages. And I was like, can I come in here and get some tissue? And we become partners. You might have heard the expression citizen scientists. Well, these are the original citizen scientists here. And we all work together because they are concerned about their communities and about how they're going to feed their families. And not just are the animals going to be there, are the animals healthy? Is it going to be safe? to eat these animals. Just like you might have heard, oh, there's certain fish that maybe we don't want to eat because they might be accumulating mercury, especially long-lived fishes. 
and mercury is one of those inorganic contaminants that we look at. And it can cause organ damage. But everything that eats anything else that has mercury in it is bioaccumulating it. That's why we have to be concerned. It's like, oh, maybe we shouldn't eat some of these long-lived fish very often. We can eat, ah, oh, let's eat tilapia or let's eat salmon. Salmon only live one to two years. So we think about, so in a, in a lot of ways, we have probably individually been thinking about turnover in tissues and how it can be used, but we've been thinking about it more for our own diets. And the fact is now we can go, oh wait, we can step back and look at these whole food webs and go, what is their diet? Where have they been? What can they tell us? Anybody else with any additional questions? Amy, that was awesome. I mean, I, mean, <laughs> I love listening to you go uh, talk on here. And yeah, Amy was kind enough to help us out with our, our Marine Open House last Friday. So I, I, I want you to come back and do a couple more of these too, Amy. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, I got to say, it's not like we've got a, a university full of um, marine mammalogists. And, and again, for example, I'm not a marine mammalogist. I'm not a marine biologist. As I stated before, I'm an oceanographer. I'm interested about knowing what goes on in the water masses. I'm not somebody studying diseases in marine mammals or birds or sharks, but I'm using biological organisms, living plants and animals and microbes to help tell me what's going on in the world. So in a sense, we're, we're all partners, all living organisms here. So share that information. And on that, I'm gonna take a moment to put a plug in here for uh, the next International Marine Mammal Conference is actually gonna take place next December. So in 13 months in Palm Beach. So oh, wow. I am the chair this year. <laughs> of the conference. So if anyone out there here is at NOVA or coming to NOVA and is interested in participating and learning more and hearing from some of the world's foremost um, marine mammal related researchers, whether they're marine mammalogists or oceanographers or chemists, let me know. That's awesome. Well, it's great. It's coming to Palm Beach. Yep. Yep, so it's just down the road, as they say. <laughs> Anybody have any additional questions? I know we still have about 12, 13 people, are still uh, participants still in here. And then we, I don't think we went longer, we went right on time, actually, Amy, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, cool. again, feel free at any point to reach out, send me a message, and I'd be happy to get back with you guys. Awesome. Thank you again, Amy. I really appreciate it. Dr. Hirons, once again, thanks again. It was nice to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Bye, everyone. Be safe. Just wrapping up. Awesome. I think that's it on there. Everybody's off the attendees list. Yep. We had up to 19, I think, at one point there. So I appreciate it. And even Dean Nevin showed up in there too as well. Oh, did so. she? Yeah, it's like you have no concept of who's out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we had a lot of interest. Um, I know on social media too, a couple bunch of students emailed me and said, hey, can you, are you recording this? And we are recording. We've had some troubles with being I able to I even, even 